Good morning, Strasburg United Methodist Church. Today is April 3rd, 2022. Uh, we are continuing with our, our five spiritual practices of fruitful congregations this week, and this is the, the last Sunday before we get into the Palm and, and Passion Sunday and the week before Jesus died. So uh, today I would like to just share with you some uh, great information about what's happening at our church during Holy Week. Uh, this uh, Sunday, actually April 3rd, we're going to be having an Easter egg hunt uh, combined with our partners over at the Lutheran Church next door at 11 a.m. And then next week, uh, we're going to have, of course, Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday, followed by Monday, Thursday services on April 14th, a Good Friday service. Uh, it's actually an ecumenical uh, Good Friday service at SB Baptist Church, followed by a fish fry and then on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, we have worship services at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 a.m. And, and we are actually welcoming a number of new people into our church, um, people who are going to be baptized and confirmed uh, after they've gone through a process of examination and exploration. So we are excited to continue to be a church active in our community, and uh, we thank you for joining us online, but we hope that you can make it in person back to one of our worship services. Will you join with me now as we open in prayer? Creator God, you have formed us as your own. So whether we are weeping or laughing, dreaming or shouting for joy, we are always coming home to you. For all of this and more, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Rich Gersh has prepared some music for you today. I hope that you enjoy his gift of song. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising And day is breaking in my soul Oh, where are our dear fathers? Oh, where are our dear fathers? Down in the fields of prey, and day is breaking in my soul, and where are our dear mothers? Oh, where are our dear mothers? They have gone to heaven shouting The day is breaking in my soul And where is my sweet Savior? Will you join with me now in our prayer for illumination? Break open the scriptures through the power of your spirit, O God. Let your word, read and proclaimed, pour out until its fragrance fills this house and our lives. Then anointed with your word, send us out to share the good news we have received. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is with us always. Amen. Our first scripture today comes from Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 through 6. Send out your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will get it back. Divide your means seven ways, or even eight, for you do not know what disaster may happen on earth. 
When clouds are full, they empty rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Whoever observes the wind will not sow, and whoever regards the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know how the breath comes to the bones in the mother's womb, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. And from Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I met Charles when he and I and a dozen other pastors were beginning our three-year provisional process of being ordained in the United Methodist Church. Charles and I couldn't be more different. Here I was, a wet-behind-the-ears pastor serving in my first appointment in Virginia, and he had already built one church from scratch in California before coming to Virginia to do the same. At the time, I was only 28 years old, and he was 50. Despite those differences, we had some similarities. Both he and I had grown up as children of military officers. We both loved to travel. Both of us had a passion to share the love of God with others as missionaries in the United Methodist Church. Now, there was one other key difference. Where I had grown up as a middle-class American kid who was always involved in church, the journey that Charles took to become a United Methodist pastor involved many more risks. You see, Charles was Vietnamese, the son of a, a South Vietnamese army officer. In 1975, when the U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam ended, Charles was one of nearly 800,000 people who took to the sea to escape the communist takeover of Vietnam. Many of those boat people never made it to freedom, often becoming victims of piracy or slavery or poor weather. And after several tries, Charles finally made it to Thailand, where he took up a trade as an electrician. Charles began life as a Buddhist, was educated by the Roman Catholic Church, but he said that his transformation to becoming a United Methodist was born in the middle of the sea between Vietnam and Thailand. As the stormy weather threatened to swamp the boat, he prayed to whatever God would listen, If you save me, I will serve you. When he finally arrived in Thailand, the kindness of United Methodist missionaries enabled him to connect with family who had already made it to California, and who was able to rejoin his family in the early 1980s. During our three-year provisional process, our group of pastors met several times per year. Charles had been assigned to start a new Vietnamese-speaking church outside of Washington, D.C., and like Korean and Hispanic pastors before him, he was the bridge for native speakers to their new homeland of America. As a pastor, he was their guide through the immigration system. He educated people about our legal system. He often served as a translator, not only of language, but of culture, and he worked hard. I saw a transformation in him about a third of the way through our journey to ordination. He had the opportunity to travel back to Thailand to visit some Vietnamese communities in that country. The General Board of Global Ministries was trying to address the plight of migrant workers in countries throughout Southeast Asia. Charles came back from one of those trips, scarred by what he had seen. He told our group of pastors about visiting Vietnamese workers imprisoned in work camps in Thailand. You see, Vietnam would ship workers to Thailand, and the multinational companies would pay Vietnam for every worker that was sent over. It worked out well for Thailand and Vietnam. Thailand would be able to provide a dedicated labor force. The multinationals would pay very little money for workers. Vietnam would receive foreign currency for their government. And the workers were in a foreign country, far from their relatives in Vietnam, who may cause trouble for the government. 
Thailand did not care about the workers. They were Vietnamese, and they were not a problem for the Thai government. The workers were isolated in work camps behind fences, were fed very simple bowls of rice, maybe some meat every once in a while, and if they became too sick to work and had to be sent home, they were forced to pay off their debt to the state through labor camps back in Vietnam. Charles spoke about sneaking into those camps and smuggling in Bibles and attempting to share hope with his hopeless countrymen. As we gathered for our second annual retreat as clergy, being prepared for ordination, Charles told us that he had made a momentous decision. He was in talks with the General Board of Global Ministries to be assigned as a missionary working in Southeast Asia to address the plight of the enslaved and mistreated workers. And I remember thinking that after all, all he went through, from his several perilous journeys across dangerous seas to a 25-year journey towards ordination in the United Methodist Church, here he was, willing to risk his life to help people who were suffering. Bishop Robert Schnazy says that fruitful congregations engage in risk-taking mission and service. For the first five centuries of Christianity, the early church celebrated the lives of the martyrs, beginning with the first, Jesus of Nazareth, who gave up his life so that we could find reconciliation with God. The book of Acts speaks about Stephen, who preached in front of Pharisees who stoned him to death and left their outer robes piled at the feet of Saul, the persecutor, as they took up those heavy stones to kill. Now Saul, who became the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, was also persecuted, enduring prison, and as tradition teaches us, was beheaded in Rome for sharing his faith. Now when Christianity became fashionable, when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the tradition of martyrdom faded from our history. What rose in its place was a monasticism that taught about self-sacrifice, and the journey of faith is an inward struggle against the temptations of the world. Being a, a Christian in the United States is not as risky as it was for the first Christians. We may risk ridicule, we may risk our reputation, but for the most part, we don't risk our lives. So the question arises, how do we engage in risk-taking mission and service? In our reading from Ecclesiastes, the ancient wisdom writer teaches us to acknowledge Nothing in this life can be known. Even in the everyday business of trade, we don't know if every boat we send out will come back. He states that whoever observes the wind will not sow, and whoever regards the clouds will not reap. If we worry too much about what may happen, we will never risk anything. But Jesus says something very similar during the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Both Jesus and the wisdom writer of Ecclesiastes tell us to live our lives and trust that God will provide for us. Risk-taking mission and service means moving beyond a life of comfort and living into a life dealing with the unexpected. I've mentioned more than a few times in the last few weeks that we need to see the world with God's eyes. We are called to love like God loves. That means that we can't turn a blind eye to the needs of our world and community. Some of us have been captivated by the sights and sounds of the war in Ukraine. We have rounded up a few more cents at 7-Eleven to help the Red Cross, or rounded up to the next dollar at PetSmart to rescue refugee pets in Ukraine. And certainly sacrificing some of our financial resources will help those in need. Faraway places are not the only places where risk-taking mission and service is needed. There are many in our own community who live with hopelessness and struggle. If you talk to a teacher, you will hear about children who are feeling lost right now and are in desperate need of mental health care. If you talk to workers at McDonald's or 7-Eleven, they will tell you about how their pay does not keep up with increases in rent and health care. 
you talk to some of the elderly in our own communities, they will tell you stories of being victimized by their children and grandchildren, eager to get their hands on a perceived inheritance. The intake counselors at Shenandoah Alliance for Shelter and Response and Family Promise have shared story after story of people in our county who are trying to overcome challenges that most of us will never have to face. Presbyterian writer, preacher, and teacher Frederick Buechner once wrote that the place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. You and I are called to pay attention to the world's deep hunger. You and I are called to see the world with God's eyes. You and I are called to offer God's love and grace to those who need it, whether they know it or not. If we are to be a fruitful congregation, we need to step out of the comfort of our lives and step into those places that are unknown. Now, I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness and answering the questions that I've given you each week. I have so much information to share with our church council about the direction that we need to head next as a congregation. And this week, I want you to answer two questions. The first is this. What risky thing is God calling you to do to help our world? What risky thing is God calling you to do to help our world? The second is this. What is the greatest need of our community that our church should address? What is the greatest need of our community that our church should address? I want to close with some more of my friend Charles's story. After Charles was ordained elder in our Virginia Annual Conference, he worked for eight years as a missionary in the General Board of Global Ministries in Thailand, lifting up the plight of workers in Southeast Asia and bringing many into a relationship with God. Charles is now back in California, and five years ago, he started a brand new Vietnamese-speaking congregation in San Jose that has grown leaps and bounds and has connected many to a language of faith. He's now 68 years old and has a vision for his congregation beyond the time that he has left before he retires. I'm happy to know that his dangerous and risk-taking mission and service did not end his life and that his ministry continues to bear much fruit. I hope that you hear this story as a challenge to your own sense of calling to be a disciple serving our Lord Jesus Christ. And may you go in peace. Amen.